Having a formal description of a game is one thing. Being able to use that description to play the game effectively is something else entirely. The player must be able to compute the initial state of the game, must be able to compute which moves are legal in every state, must be able to determine the state resulting from a particular combination of moves, must be able to compute the value of each state for each player, and it must be able to determine whether any given state is terminal. Since game descriptions are written in symbolic logic, it's obviously necessary for a game player to do some amount of automated reasoning. Now, there are two extremes here. One possibility is for the game player to process the game description interpretively throughout a game. The second possibility is for the player to use the description to devise a specialized program and then use that program to play the game. It's effectively automatic programming. As this is just an introduction, uh, we will discuss the first possibility and leave it to you to think about the second possibility in various hybrid approaches. To start with, the player can use the game description to determine the initial state. In the case of tic-tac-toe, we have a board with nine empty cells. Given a state, like the one we just saw, the player can use the game description to compute the legal moves for each of the players. In this case, the white player can mark any of the nine cells, and the black player must, must do nothing. In other words, it executes the no-op action. Given a state, and the player's actions, a player can compute the next state using the update rules in the game description. In the case shown here, if the white player plays the mark 1-3 action in the initial state, and the black player does no op, then the result is a state in which there's an X in the upper right hand corner. One way for a player to decide on a course of action in a match is to use these computations repeatedly to expand the game tree. Starting in a known state, it computes the legal actions for itself and its opponents in a manner just discussed. For each combination of actions of the players, it simulates the actions to obtain the next state and thereby expands the tree. Here we see the tic-tac-toe tree expand at one level. Repeating this, uh, a player can expand the tree to two levels three levels, and so forth, until it encounters the terminal states uh, on every branch, such as the one shown here in the middle of the bottom row. By examining the various branches, it can choose the one that it produces the best payoff. Now, of course, this choice depends on the moves of the other players, and it must consider all possible opponent moves or make some assumptions about the things that the other players will or will not do. In principle, the procedure allows a player to identify the best possible strategy to play any game. Unfortunately, even in cases where there is a clear-cut solution, the tree may be so large as to make it practically impossible for any player to expand the game tree. In tic-tac-toe, there are just 5,000 states, which is a reasonably manageable number. But there are more than 10 to the 30th states in chess, and using this approach, the player would run out of time and memory long before finishing. The alternative is to do incremental search, on each move expanding the tree as much as possible, and then making a choice based on the apparent value of non-terminal states. Now, in traditional game playing, where the rules are known in advance, the programmer can invent a game-specific evaluation function to help in this regard. For example, in chess, we know that states with higher piece count and greater board control are better than ones with less material, material or less control. Unfortunately, it's not possible for a GGP programmer to invent such game-specific rules in advance, since the game's rules are not known until the game begins. Uh, the program must evaluate the states for itself. The good news is that there are some evaluation techniques that always work. For example, there's no harm preferring new states to states that have previously been seen, provided, of course, that there's a way to get back to the original states. Also, for players to determine that some observable condition corresponds to distance from the goal, then it's a good idea to minimize that quantity. Suppose, for example, the player were in a cave trying to get out. If it saw a brighter light in one tunnel than another, it might go for the brighter light. Finally, there's some states that can be determined to be bad even if other states are not known to be good. Uh, Silly example, uh, stepping off the roof of a tall building is probably not a great way to get to the store, at least not in the real world. Another possibility is to use non-guaranteed uh, evaluation functions, sometimes called heuristics. 
A number of such heuristics have been proposed over the years. Goal proximity is one of those. Uh, proponents of this heuristic argue that all other things being equal, it's a good idea to prefer states that are closer to goal states than states that are farther away. Distance here is usually judged by similarity between states, that is, the number of facts in common in the descriptions of the two states. Mobility is another general heuristic. Proponents argue that, all other things being equal, it's better to move to a state that affords the player greater mobility, that gives it more possible actions, better than being boxed into a quarter. Uh, symmetrically, proponents of mobility uh, argue that it is good to minimize the mobility of one's opponents. Now, all of these heuristics have been shown to be effective in some games. Unfortunately, they are only heuristics. They sometimes fail, and sometimes with comical consequences. The final match of GGP06 is an example. The game was cylinder checkers, that is, checkers played on a cylinder. The game wraps around vertically. Recall that in uh, checkers, a player is permitted to move one of his ordinary pieces, pieces that are not kings, that is, one square forward in each turn. Your red is moving from the top to the bottom, and black is moving from the bottom to the top. If a piece is blocked by an opponent's player, he can jump that player if there is an empty square on the other side. Moreover, the player must make such a jump if one is available. Uh, the objective of the game is to take all or as many of one, the opponent's pieces as possible while preserving one's own. Here's a snapshot of the game. It's Red's turn to play. What should he do? And what do you think he did? Okay, here's a hint. The player in this case was Kloon player, and it had decided for some reason or other that limiting the opponent's mobility was a good heuristic. If we're to move the rearmost piece, Black would have multiple possible moves. However, if it were to move the piece in front, then Black would be forced to capture it. In other words, it would have at most one move. Clearly, moving the forward piece minimizes the opponent's mobility. So, that's what Kloon player did. Actually, the whole match played out this way, with uh, Red giving Black captures at every opportunity. It was sad to watch, but, but frankly a little comical at the same time. The moral here is that while non-guaranteed heuristics are sometimes useful, they're not always useful. An alternative to evaluation functions like these is Monte Carlo search. The basic idea is simple. The player expands the tree for a few levels. Then rather than using a local heuristic to evaluate a state, you make some probes from that state to the end of the game by selecting random moves for all players, which can be done very rapidly sums up the total rewards for all such probes, and divides by the number of probes to obtain an estimated utility for that state. You can then use these expected utilities uh, to, in comparing states and selecting actions. Monte Carlo its variants have been proven highly successful in general game playing, virtually every general game playing program today using some variant of Monte Carlo search. Okay, this discussion of game tree search and heuristics reveals just how difficult the GGP problem is. Monte Carlo works amazingly well, but even it breaks down badly in certain cases. Fortunately, there's another complementary approach to general game playing that has tremendous power, and it's called metagaming. Metagaming is problem solving in the world of games. It involves reasoning about games, and by extension, game players and game playing. As stated, um, this is an extremely general definition. It includes both game design and game analysis. It includes reasoning about games in general as well as reasoning about specific games and specific matches of specific games. Significantly, it includes what programmers do in devising programs to play specific games as well as what programmers do in devising general game playing programs. Metagame is usually done offline during the brief period after a player receives the game rules and game and gameplay begins. Or sometimes it's done in parallel with ordinary game tree search. In general game playing, we're primarily interested in those types of metagaming that can be automated. This raises the question of distinction between ordinary game playing and metagaming game playing. Metagaming. Uh, can we distinguish the two? Well it's not that easy, but there are some differences. 
To begin with, ordinary game tree search can be viewed as a degenerated form, degenerate form of metagaming, one in which the metagamer must find the best action for a specific role in a specific game starting in a specific state. By contrast, in some cases, metagaming sometimes involves information and goals that are different from the specifics used in game tree search. To begin with, metagaming can take into account information other than the game description. For example, it might take into account past experience. It, in round robin tournaments where total return, total the sum of the values over multiple matches, in cases like that it might select a different strategy than in an elimination ladder where being beating one's opponent is more important than the score that one gets so long as it's greater than the opponent's score. Metagaming is also sometimes done with less information than is used in match play. For example, without information about the role, initial state, goals, termination, and so forth. As a result, metagaming can be more general, deriving conclusions that apply across different matches and different players. Um, also, the goal of metagaming is broader than that of game tree search. It's not so much concerned with selecting the actions on a specific, of a specific player in a specific game, but rather concerned with devising a game tree search program or optimizing an existing program to search a game tree without actually searching the tree itself. Okay, well, whether or not this concept of automated metagaming can be distinguished from game tree search, there's no doubt that the concept is used to good effect in many, many general game playing programs. And we'll have a chance to look at some metagaming techniques in the uh, course. Uh, before we leave the idea, the, the concept, I want to give one example of metagaming. Uh, the example here is uh, called game decomposition or sometimes factoring. Uh, consider the example of hodgepodge. Hodgepodge is actually two games glued together. Here we uh, show chess and Othello, but it could be any two games. Uh, one move in a uh, game of hodgepodge corresponds to one move on each of the two constituent games. Winning requires winning at least one of the two games while not losing the other. What makes hodgepodge interesting is that it's factorable. That is, it can be divided into two independent games. Realizing this can have dramatic effect. To see this, consider the size of the game tree for hodgepodge. Supposing that one game tree has branching factor A and the other has branching factor B. Then the branching factor of the joint game is A times B. And any, at any point in the game, a player has A times B possible moves. And the size of the fringe of the game tree at level N is A times B to the N. However, the two games are independent. Moving in one subgame does not affect the state of the other subgame. So the player really should be searching two smaller game trees, one with branching factor A and the other with branching factor B. In this way, at depth n, there would be only a to the n plus b to the n possible states. This is a huge decrease in the size of the search base. So factoring uh, is just one example of game reformulation and metagaming. There are many others. For example, it's sometimes possible to find symmetries in games that cuts down on the search space. Uh, in some ways, uh, some games, there are bottlenecks that allow for a different type of factoring. Uh, consider, for example, a game made up of one or more sub-games in which it's necessary to win the first game before moving on to the second game and so forth. In such a case, there's no need to search to a terminal state in the overall game. It's sufficient to just limit the search to the termination in the current sub-game, and only after that's done, be search to the termination condition in the next sub-game and so forth. Now, these examples are extreme cases, but they're simple everyday examples of finding structure of this sort that can help in curtailing search. Whatever sort of metagaming is done, the trick is to analyze and reformulate the game without expanding the entire game tree. The interesting thing about general game playing is this, that sometimes the cost of analysis is proportional to the size of description rather than the size of the game tree, as in the examples we just saw. And in such cases, player can expend a little time and gain a lot in search savings.